actually do uh, by introducing ourselves to the assembled millions glued to their television <laughs> screens. Um, my name is Martin Groker. I'm uh, the member for Lansdowne Ward in Abergavenny and I chair this committee. Councillor Laura Jones, Deputy Chair of this committee, uh, Councillor for Wysham. Hazel Eilert, Scrutiny. Uh, Richard Williams, Democratic Services. Non Jenkins from the Wales Audit Office. Will McLean, Chief Officer, Children and Young People. Good morning, Julie Boothroyd, Chief Officer, Social Care, Safeguarding and Health. <laughs> Mike Fowler, Parent, Governor, Representative. County Councillor Maureen Powell, Councillor for Castle Ward, Navigavenny, and a member of this committee. Councillor Joe Watkins, Councillor for Caldecott Castle, member of this committee. Tudor Thomas, County Councillor for Priory Ward uh, in Navigavenny, and a member of this committee. Uh, my name is Philip White. I'm a lay member of the Audit Committee, and I chair the Audit Committee. Sheila Woodhouse, member for Growfield Ward in Abergavenny and also member of this committee. Councillor Louise Brown, member of this committee and also a ward uh, councillor for Shire Newton. Hello, I'm, I'm Penny Jones and I'm cabinet member for Social Services, Safeguarding and Health. Uh, Pete Strong, representing the National Union of Teachers. Borida, David Jones, a member for the Criconi Ward and a member of this committee. Malcolm Lane, member of this committee and County Councillor for the Mardi Ward, Abergavenny. Councillor Val Smith, Lampadoc Ward, observing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, some special welcomes from, from me as the chair. Can I welcome the National Union of Teachers rep? You're, you're very welcome. And... To reassure you, I was for many, many years a member of the National Union of Teachers. Um, I'd like to welcome the chair of the Audit Committee, who obviously is here to, uh, to listen to the discussion on the, the first uh, agenda item, which is a report. And if you'd like to comment, I would certainly welcome you uh, speaking to the committee this morning. I'd also like to welcome our cabinet member, um, and, and the same for you, Councillor Jones. If you would like to speak to the committee, I would certainly welcome that. So, uh, if we can move on then to apologies for absence. Uh, no apologies received, Chair. Um, do we have, at this point, any declarations of interest, or shall we just take them as they come up? Uh, Councillor Lane, could I ask you to turn your mic off? Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I have not been made aware that there are any members of the public who wish to speak to us. So we're moving already on to item four, which is uh, indeed the scrutiny of the Wales Audit Office Review of Children's Safeguarding. Uh, members will remember that we were actually part of that when the uh, inspector from the Welsh Audit Office came and observed our dealings. So it's nice that we have, dare I say it, at long last uh, got the report. Some of us uh, still had hair when we were originally interviewed. Uh, but uh, having said that slightly facetious thing, um, I'm glad that you're here this morning from the Welsh Audit Office. And if you'd like to introduce our discussion, thanks. Thank you, Diolch Fawr. Um, and yes, no, I get the point completely. Um, uh, and thank you very much for being involved in the, the uh, review and for uh, your time um, as part of the interviews. And yes, we are here today. We did um, issue this to the council over the summer um, in August. Um, and I suppose it is one of those reviews, because we did it in liaison also with CIWO and Eston, we wanted to make sure that uh, we, were make, we were triangulating it uh, completely and uh, um, uh, in an evidence-based way. 
Uh, and yes, that did potentially add to the complications, but what you have is a richer and a, a, a joined up uh, report here from all, all of your regulators. Um, so, uh, well, uh, so the background to this, as you know, I won't go through, through it in detail because I'm assuming you will have read it um, yourselves, but the background, obviously, we've, we did uh, in 2015, we did a national review of um, uh, safeguard, corporate safeguarding arrangements at all 22 councils, um, and we made, I think, nine recommendations at that point to all councils. Uh, and... Also, we, we've done uh, some work in terms of uh, uh, the Curbcraft report that we did, and we also brought that back to the Council here. So this report was around looking at um, the whole uh, of the safeguarding arrangements within the whole authority safeguard arrange, uh, arrangements for children. So not just looking at social services, not just looking at education, but looking at putting the, ch the child at the centre and looking at how you as a council are safeguarding children across your services. Um, and that was a key um, focus, the key focus for this uh, piece of work. So I suppose um, uh, it's set out in, in, in two bits, really. The first bit is about uh, uh, how you have come along um, in, in that progress that you have made, so the strengths that you have. And then the, the second part of it is around what more could you be doing to improve the situation. So um, just to quickly go through that, um, our work uh, concluded that uh, the councils, the children's safeguarding policy and procedures in the council have recently improved over the last two years, but there are shortcomings in some critical areas of policy and operation. Now, why we say that um, is that we... Um, the Council's framework and arrangements for safeguarding have recently improved. The leadership and strategic direction and accountability arrangements have improved. The Council has made progress in responding to the recommendations in our Curbcraft report um, and in responding to SN and CIW reports too. The Council's safeguarding policy is comprehensive and is supported by directorate uh, safeguarding leads. Um, your safe recruitment of staff and volunteers is improving too. And the council engages effectively with external partners and the regional safeguarding board and arrangements to monitor, scrutinise and manage performance and risk are generally sound. So those are the good things that we notice as part of the progress that you've made in, in, um, over the past uh, few years in terms of moving things forward. So that's a good uh, uh, news story in terms of things are moving forward and we can see that you're committed to moving things forward. Uh, we have highlight, highlighted some areas that uh, I know Julie will come, uh, come back on how you're taking this forward in terms of uh, moving forward further and, uh, um, and the shortcomings that we came across were um, that the safeguarding policy hasn't yet sufficiently integrated, been integrated across the council. So whilst it might be very well uh, or more embedded in social services and education, there's still more to go in the other services. Um, not all aspects of safe recruitment, induction and training are consistently embedded. Again, it's about embedding it across the council and, and, and getting it consistent within, uh, within your, pro your processes. Um, your control arrangements are inconsistently applied. Well, that was at the time. Um, and, and it exposes some gaps in, in accountability for you as a council. And also weaknesses existed in the council's commissioning and contracting arrangements in relation to safeguarding children. So how do you manage and how do you relate to contractors working on your behalf? How do you make sure that all of those checks and balances are in place when there are people working on your behalf out there with children? So those are the four uh, uh, key areas for improvement. And then we made uh, four proposals for improvement, um, which were... The first one being to integrate safeguarding across the council's policy framework, and we've set out um, a couple of, uh, or three particular points there. The second uh, proposal for improvement was embed all aspects of safe recruitment, induction and training consistently, and we've made three points as to how, how we would expect to see that. Uh, proposal for improvement three is about ensuring control arrangements are consistently applied and improve performance monitoring arrangements around safeguarding to include all areas of service operation to address all gaps in accountability. This should include issuing clear guidance to managers on information on safeguarding that should be included in reports to members. 
And then the fourth and final proposal for improvement is around improving the count, um, the council should improve the its commissioning and contracting arrangements, as we've noted, um, in relation to safeguarding children by finalising the guidance on commissioning and contracting and volunteering from a safeguarding perspective. So those are the four proposals for improvement. Um, Shall I hand over to Julie now for their management response as to how you pl are, are taking this forward? Or yeah, I, I think that's a, that, that's a reasonable way forward. Um, clearly, members will, will have some questions and comments, but nonetheless, this is uh, for members, this is on page 29 of the uh, agenda, the management response. Uh, and certainly this might address some of the issues that we raised in the pre-meeting that we had to, to look at this. So, uh, yes, perhaps also a word of explanation, Ms. Boothroy, that um, when there was the slightest hesitation when you said what your role was. Long enough if this were just a minute on Radio 4 for somebody to have leapt in and said there was hesitation. Uh, for, for, for anybody watching on, on live streaming, it's, it's because we have a new senior officer. Uh, and if you've not had formal uh, congratulations from this committee, you can have them now. It's, it's good to see you in your new role. But yes, perhaps over to you for management response. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I did hesitate, and um, I'm looking at my colleague at the back, Matt, and I, who carried out some media training this week, so I think I've got a big cross for that. But uh, <laughs> I think what it is, I'm used to being, you know, this, this role is, is, is usually called, as I call it in old money, the Director of Social Services, and the long title is taking some getting used to. But uh, nonetheless, I'm thrilled, and thank you, Chair, for, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to address the, the management response uh, that we've put together today. Can I just um, explain how that's been pulled together? Because I think that's quite important in terms of how we are approaching um, the whole authority safeguarding responsibility. Um, as Non has pointed out, this, this was carried out around children safeguarding and looking at how um, the whole authority addresses that through all areas of the council. Um, we have a whole authority safeguarding group, and I know that as part of the inspection, um, there, uh, there was a representation uh, from the WAO to look at how that operated. Obviously, I'm new in post. This, this report landed, I think, the day Claire was leaving and I may have been being interviewed. So it's quite an interesting uh, juxtaposition for me. Um, so um, I welcome the report. Um, I've studied it well, and as a whole authority safeguarding group, we have studied that well as well. We have looked in, in great detail at the proposals that uh, re proposals for recommendation that have been put forward. And for me, coming in to the chief officer role, it's been an opportunity to sort of look at, well, so where have we got to? And how do we take some of this forward? Because some of the things that have been raised have been in the in the arounds for, for some time, and I will pick up <coughs> what, what progress we've made. I think, as Non says, um, you know, and as Martin uh, Chair says, that we have, this has been hanging around a while, so there has been some progress that obviously has ensured nothing stays still and things have moved forward. So if I just briefly, people will have read the management response, but I'm just going to pick out a couple of the, the sort of, what I'd say, the more important points are. Um, so I'm just going to go through, starting um, on page one, it won't be page one for you, but one of five for me. Um, with regard to the Council's um, policy framework, one of the uh, first points that was raised at point A was about identifying a project plan that underpins the integration of adult and children's safeguarding. And our response is that, um, obviously, we're not, we're not looking to do anything further than what we have at the moment. To my left, we have Diane Corrister, who is the service manager for the safeguarding unit. And underneath that, we have management arrangements for children services and for adult services. And we don't have any further plans as yet to integrate the operations further. So that's why that um, isn't subject to a, a further project plan. In terms of uh, reframing the, the, the strategic risk at, at B here uh, to enable a smarter approach, um, there has been a lot of work going on in the background, and Richard, to my left, um, has has they've been looking at the responsibility to make sure that we are much smarter in the way that we, we, we put our action plans together. I'm not planning to go through every single one, um, but the one I did want to focus on a little bit was P2, um, embedding aspects of safe recruitment, induction and training consistently. 
Um, I think this has been one of the areas of biggest debate for us at um, Hull Authority Safeguarding Group about how you take a workforce approach across the large workforce and ensure that we have got every post, as I call it, tagged and bagged, as in we know what requirement there is around training, that we've recorded that, we're appropriately recording the level of training and that we have a system that can review that. I think it's fair to say that we've made some real breakthroughs around this area and the piece of work that's going to take, well has already started to, to take place, is really each designated lead is going to be sitting down with the training record system and literally housekeeping and validating every single name. We know the levels, that's set out quite clearly, but we want to make sure that all our records are up to date so that when we do run reports that come back to um, Children and Young People Select Committee, that that is accurate and up to date. And it feels like we've made a, a, a real step forward in that area. Um, in terms of the last point that I'd want to pull up is around the contracting and commissioning. Again, um, quite um, a systematic approach has been taken. From a social care and health adults perspective, um, we have a large commissioning um, base and a large commissioning activity. One of our service managers has designed the self-assessment template that is, that is being used and is being tested in that arena now. Um, once that is tested, that is going to be then um, reported to senior leadership team and then each of the designated leads for safeguarding will take that into their service areas to actually carry out that piece of work in a syst systematic way way. Um, we'll then be looking at bringing that information back into the whole authority safeguarding group. I think the other thing I would want to mention just in summary is that all of the actions that form part of the management response will actually be tabled in the whole authority safeguarding action plan that we that we monitor each time we meet. Um, it feels like we've made some good progress. I welcome the, the proposals that WAO have put forward for us to to, to work further on um, and I'm confident that we're going to be you know by the end of the the, the, the frame time frame that we've given ourselves in a much much better position and I'm happy to take any questions okay thank you very much indeed uh, so members over to you now who'd like to uh, ask the first question yes yeah vice chair Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll go straight in now. I was thinking there might be some questions first, but um, as an outcome to this um, f from the work that you've done, it seems very apparent to me that um, we need to scrutinise the area of school transport a lot more. And, and I'd like to suggest, Chair and Hazel, that as a committee that we delve into this a lot more and uh, have the opportunity to scrutinise it further. I think the processes um, and where responsibilities lie are quite unclear. And I think that in regarding to, regard to safeguarding and well-being, I think of children, I think that we need to look into this a lot further. I do think there are some significant shortcomings, um, and I do think we need to be more vigilant um, in scrutinising this area. So I'd like to suggest that we put it in our forward work programme if the committee agrees. So Thank there you. we've got one uh, potential outcome that we can uh, record and take forward to cabinet. Uh, certainly, in, in, in pre-meeting, there was discussion, j just so officers are aware, I suppose, that it, it, one, one area was uh, young people and children going to school on public transport. Not, we were more concerned that with that rather than specific taxes which might pick up a child. Uh, it's where many of our youngsters go to school on public transport routes uh, and, and how we can um, look, look at that issue. At, um, Councillor Thomas. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'd agree with the Vice Chair's comments. Uh, in reality, in, in any authority, children travelling on transport, where, whether it be going to school, and that, that, that's my main experience, somebody who taught, but also had three children, two of whom went through Welsh medium and had to travel quite long distances and when they were young. Um, it, it is an area that, that probably concerns most authorities, uh, and I would also add the fact that we live in a very rural, rural authority and lots of children are picked up in, in farming areas by a taxi where they might be in that, that car or vehicle with, with just one child with, with the driver, etc. Uh, in, in an urban area, getting on a bus, you've got 30 or 40 kids there. That, that in itself creates sort of safety. Um, and obviously, 
we, we don't have, we have some of our own school transport, but we do obviously employ a, a large number of subcontractors. If you look at something like the Clantoni Valley, etc., and other uh, distant areas. So I, I, I do feel concerned. And having taught in secondary as well, okay, a long time ago, but um, particularly with, with younger drivers, of them flirting with, with, with younger girls on the bus, etc., and, and getting to a point of being inappropriate uh, in their behaviour, um, I do think it's something we really need to look at. Um, Mr Fowler, uh, and, and then Councillor Brown. Um, I'd just like to have a quick look at uh, paragraph uh, 72 in the report. Um, so it says that the council has not systematically tracked SIPs or audited the content to ensure risks are universally mitigated and that gaps in particular services approach to children's safeguarding are not present. Uh, and it says this is an area, uh, an important area for improvement. So that kind of takes me down the path of, of how we came to discover Curbcraft. And it makes me wonder, is there any more services lurking around the council that we're going to get surprised by or is there anything else out there how, how deep have we investigated all the services that we operate Did you want, yeah sorry thank you um it's a it's a good question and i think it's always an area of concern for any of us who are working um in in, in this arena that something could could occur what we have to be able to do is look with each of, the, of our um, areas of, of business across the council and, and dig deep and that's going to keep going and certainly reference to the service improvement plans um, there is a much more uh, um, there's going to be a much stronger emphasis, emphasis in, the, in the, the newer iteration around the safeguarding element that service areas and we're going to want to be able to see that they have really looked at all key activities and all service service risk areas, I, I suppose I, I would argue. And actually, part of what we've done to enhance that is have a, a system called a SAFE, and it may have been that it's been discussed in here uh, previously, which is an audit that each of the service areas carries out through a safeguarding lens. And that work has been carried out in every single area to expose what are the risks and then looking to mitigate those. Now we'd expect to see some of that both in the whole, whole authority safeguarding um, arena but also in the individual service plans. So this is this is getting hold of that and pulling it forward with traction. I don't know whether Diane you want to mention anything about the safes particular I just think it might be useful to understand what that mechanism is because of course it doesn't go into detail in this report but obviously it's underneath the service are you happy to yeah yeah <clears throat> I'm not sure. Does this one work? Yes. Oh, yeah. um, just in terms of, because you've mentioned curb craft, if I just give an example of when we did the safe with the, the safe audit with curb craft, um, the when we went through that, which looks at policy, aligning the department or the the area to policy, but ensuring that training policy procedures, working procedures, how that's shared out amongst the staff, how that works with all, all parts of different parts of the authority. All of those parts were covered. When we did that with the curb craft managers, they said if we'd have done this two years ago, we wouldn't have been in the position we are now and the council wouldn't have been in that position. And so we have, as a safeguarding unit, we've taken the lead to support all directorates in managing their safes. There will always be times, and we're doing another run through now, we have a database, because there'll always be parts of the service we think, actually that's not been included. So then we are going to do more and expand that with foster carers and all those wider parts of the services. It includes third sector services at some points when they have direct involvement and there's an interface with the local authority services. So it's a ongoing programme, but what it means is it ties everything in terms of the policy with regards to governance, safeguarding, training, safe recruitment, working to policies and procedures through a safeguarding lens, and that's all, all part of the safe. They have an action plan which should be then carried forward into their business improvement plans. And there's a so hopefully we will not be in a position where we find ourselves with another curb craft. But we always say hopefully because there will always be things that come forward that we don't know about. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would certainly uh, support the uh, vi Vice Chair's proposal for looking at home to school transport in more detail on the safeguarding uh, aspect because it's something that's been um, highlighted in, in this report. But I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it should be restricted to buses because I think taxis are an important area as well because you have... Um, uh, you know, taxi drivers um, who are taking vulnerable children, often on their own, and it's mentioned in this report in rural areas as well. Now, it says in this report that um, taxi drivers um, are, you know, they monitor their own um, DBS and have to report on change in circumstances. But the escort drivers are left to the taxi drivers to ensure that the DBS uh, checks. And I think that there's actually a gap there because um, knowing a little bit about licensing uh, legislation, uh, you may say, oh, well, it's a licensing uh, responsibility. But licensing, look at the suitability of taxi drivers. And that's all. So they don't look at the general policy implications in terms of uh, taxis, you know, um, you know, DBS che checks for escort drivers and so forth. I, uh, sorry, I escort people who accompany people with learning difficulties and who need somebody there in the car with them uh, to escort them. So I think there is a, a potential safeguarding gap there. So it's not necessarily a question of saying, you know, it's, it's a licensing committee responsibility we we need to look at this in a bit more depth in terms of um uh you know policy changes so that we cover those gaps and uh you know so i'd be very much in favor of home to school transport but don't forget the taxi element and don't assume that licensing will cover it because of these gaps they can only go for what the licensing acts say in terms of suitability of taxi drivers. And if you think about the uh, Bradford case where um, you know those poor girls were um, uh, in a situation with uh, taxi drivers where they were groomed and so forth. I mean, you know, there are uh, risks there, and probably more risks in a sense than bus journeys because um, you know they might be on their own with um, vulnerable uh, children. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I take that point entirely, and, and uh, in a parallel, certainly um, a school using a supply teacher, it, it is simply not good enough for the school to say, oh, we, we assume the check had been done by the supply agency, and I think that's the same sort of example here, isn't it? We're saying, oh, it's up to the taxi firms to check, rather than us centrally doing the check. Uh, Miss Boothroyd. I, th I think really important points that are being raised, and I think for me, looking at the uh, management response that we're talking about, there are two areas that could uh, could assist, I think. There's the commissioning and contracting lens that we can look through. So when we are actually procuring services, if we are, you know, true to our word, going to really, in, if you like, enforce the safeguarding uh, approach, that is an area where which we need to strengthen uh, when we are looking at procuring that service. And then the other area is through the safe. So as part of my responsibility, public protection, Dave Jones, his safe needs to pick up and does to some extent this, this area of potential risk so that we can monitor that through. The wider bit um, uh, in terms of a forward work, pro work program approach, I, I'm, I'm not so sure, but certainly in, 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 in this aspect, we can, we can look at that through, through those two lenses in effect. Do we have any further comments? We've certainly got one. Oh, sorry, Councillor Woodhouse. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered if it was possible at this stage to, to give more information about um, the integrated approach regarding uh, housing under Section 74. There's several issues raised there regarding children with regard to housing. Um, what sort of plans have you got to integrate this? Um, or is it something that perhaps the audit could be looking at in, in future to help out with? Um, 
Thank you, Councillor Woodhouse. In terms of, obviously, it wasn't a specific um, proposal recommendation, and I haven't commented on it in the management response, but certainly as part of our whole authority safeguarding group, the whole issue around bed and breakfast and the appropriateness of that provision for supporting uh, families with, with, with young children particularly, and young adults, is an area that we, we have looked at and tightened some of the uh, responsibility for scrutiny around that. Um, and those checks and balances have to be weighed up with, you know, the need to actually place people in, in a crisis, in an emergency, but actually making sure that we've got enough rigour to actually safeguard wh where we can, because those are private businesses to all extents and so, uh, to all extent and purposes. But obviously, again, through the safe lens, and I, I'm using that again, I know, but actually it does pick up the activity in a service area and say, what, from a safeguarding Point of view do we need to consider and obviously as a whole group we can challenge back on certainly some of those issues that are not present in the recommendations here but actually do form part of the agenda of the whole authority safeguarding work um, councillor jones welcome to our meeting thank you chair it isn't directly uh, um, related to what's just gone on but it is part of 74 section 74 and I'd just like to make a comment about um, the comment prioritizing access to adaptations through disabled facilities grants for those that need them can significantly improve a child's welfare. And I would just like to state at this, this stage that um, we have to prioritize. Funding runs out. A considerable amount of funding, more funding has been put into this grant. Um, but it's better outcomes for people generally. And whilst it mentions there a child's welfare, we have to think of everyone's welfare. So it isn't just directly involved with children. I'd like to point out at this stage that when people have to wait until the next stage because of prioritization, that they are well looked after and supported by Monmouthshire. So please don't think that they just go off the list and wait. So that, that's, I'd just like to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just in uh, response to the housing matter that uh, Councillor Woodhouse uh, raised, um, and uh, whilst the word housing doesn't appear in the proposals for improvement, it basic uh, P1, P2, P3 and P4 obviously points to um, all of those, uh, housing all of the services across um, the council. So to integrate safeguarding across the council's policy framework, but we've drawn attention particularly to some areas. Uh, embed all aspects of safeguarding, induction and training consistently, um, and ensure control arrangements are consistently applied across um, the services, and also improve the council's commissioning and contracting. So housing is in, in, in that. It might, the word housing isn't, might not be there, so it, it was a good point that you raised in terms of um, making sure that that's part of the whole of the council's policy framework. So thank you. Thank you for that response. Councillor Brown. Yeah, um, you know, obviously I've, I've listened to um, uh, the management response on this and it does um, mention how um, uh, basically all different service areas have got to uh, look at this issue of safeguarding. So I think in the report it mentions a, a sort of a root, root and branch uh, review sort of thing to make sure everything's covered. But my concern is is that although um, sort of on the surface it may appear that everything is, is covered, I still think there's a good reason to look in more detail at home to school transport because what I'm concerned about is just to make sure that, um, you know, there aren't these gaps that, um, uh, you know, uh, children can, can fall through and to, to look at it in more detail because it is possible that um, if a... Um, uh, you know, somebody responsible for a particular service area comes up with <clears throat> recommendations to make sure that safeguarding is properly covered. It would be helpful if we knew in more detail what those recommendations were, because we might be able to um, suggest one or two things that, that possibly haven't been thought of. And so I do think it is very useful to look at that in, in further depth rather than just say in general terms, well, you know, uh, chief officers are, are, are looking at this because um, you know we can all we can all say that, but I mean, how much detail they look at it and what bits and 
Bob's, I'm very much a detailed person, you know, so I, I like to know that, you know, boxes have been ticked and so forth. You know, um, uh, I mean, a very simple example of this is like the taxi drivers about making sure that the uh, uh, people who are escorting them have got uh, up-to-date DBS checks and, and that sort of thing. Now, that's just one thing that's uh, been res uh, rose in the... Um, audit report but there could be others across different service areas and i think in order to ensure that we aren't um just ourselves ticking boxes make sure that we've actually ticked those boxes in detail thank you yes thank you yeah certainly i think that that um, w we can as a committee ask that this becomes part of future work and we can get reports on that and uh, i think that's a clear recommendation from this discussion mr mclean Thank you, Chair. Just firstly, just to reassure members that uh, I don't think Julie or I, as chief officers, would glibly tick a box around safeguarding, just to be absolutely categorical around that. I think we are, it's fundamentally important how we get our children safely to school to make sure that they are accompanied by the right people. Um, you're right, there are significant challenges given the rural nature of the council. Um, and they are challenges that other parts of Wales face as well. So we have to take that learning to see if there are uh, ways we can uh, enhance our um, safeguarding um, methods around that. I think I'd like to suggest to the committee, if possible, that um, in terms of bringing um, further information back, that we do that actually through the whole authority safeguarding group. All of the senior officers necessary and relevant to that discussion are represented on that. Um, I would suggest that we start with the uh, the safe that will have been completed by the passenger transport unit but then potentially we undertake some more detailed checking around that so that we can report back into this committee and give you that level of assurance that you want is that okay Chair? Uh, that's that's fine thank <laughs> thank you very much indeed uh, i wonder if i could just uh, raise one issue that uh, miss eilis has just brought to my attention of a member of the public who who wrote in a parent to say that her 11-year-old has two separate bus journeys to school and, and sometimes has to wait 20 minutes between the two services. Uh, and, and, and I think that's an issue. Um, and uh, in, in asking for this to go forward to the Future Work Programme, I think that would be a specific thing that we could ask officers to look at as well. So thank you, Ms. Eilert, for, for raising that issue. Um, Audit Committee, obviously, has a very clear responsibility for safeguarding areas and indeed it's a Welsh Audit Office report. As Chair of, of the Audit Committee, is there any comment you'd like to make at this point here? I had a few thoughts as the discussion, discussion went along. Um, in the same way, it's quite uh, very good and appropriate for the Wales Audit Office to be looking at this area. Is this, of course, a continuing matter of concern for the Council's own uh, audit committee. Um, I don't know at the moment if there are any plans to let this particular report uh, go to the audit committee itself for, for discussion from, from that point of view. Um, I think it might be um, a good idea at some point if the audit committee was able to look at the implementation of the recommendations uh, in the report, which I see both of them are to be implemented this year the latest by March 19, uh, 2019, I believe. So that won't be too far off. Perhaps that we could um, invite you, uh, Miss Boothroy, perhaps to to come to the to the audit committee. Um, I'm glad to see internal audit have already been uh, referenced in the report itself at Para 68. It's always very useful for the audit committee when internal audit can give us uh, reports on, on on what's going on. Um, just on the uh, recommendations itself, I too was, was uh, intrigued, uh, interested in paragraph six, uh, 74 about the, um, about the housing issues. Um, let me just go back to that paragraph. I think at the time when uh, I was interviewed for this, um, for this review and there were other meetings going on, uh, there was mention about the disabled facilities grants. I think the issue for the audit committee there was what we were learning about when performance indicators were perhaps not met. Um, I'm not aware that we get an exception report on, on performance indicators not being met, and I think that might be a good idea, especially when we're looking to uh, integrate areas of policy across 
uh, a wide range of council responsibilities. So perhaps the uh, scrutiny manager could um, either let me know or, or think about that uh, in due course. Well, I, I wonder if I could ask uh, Richard Jones if he could uh, comment rather than yeah. Miss Eilis. Uh, check on close enough to the microphone. Um, thank you for those points. Uh, I'll pick up some of the ones around where this report will then go in terms of accountability and follow up for the management response and implementing those actions. Uh, the report came before Children and Young People Select Committee today. Obviously, the topic around children's safeguarding is very relevant to your remit, and it was felt it was appropriate to come here for you to scrutinise the report and also the council's management response. As the, as the Audit Committee Chair rightly points out, the committee has a role in monitoring and implementation of the Wales Audit Office proposals for improvement that are issued, uh, and on a six-monthly basis, uh, that's reported through to you. The actions that have been included as part of the management response will now form part of that regular six-monthly report you will receive uh, and we'll track the progress against them alongside all the other proposals we have received from Wales Audit Office as part of their performance audit work. Um, I think the next one is due to you at your next meeting. Obviously, it may not be too much update, particularly on this, as it's new work, uh, but we'll update it as far as we can for that and continue in, in, the, in the future. Uh, I'll also pick up on the point around, I think you mentioned performance indicators and performance reporting. Um, as members of this committee will be aware, we, we centrally, as, as a team, report through to you uh, our performance against our key performance indicator suite as a, as a council. Uh, we've now got an established corporate plan uh, that sets out some of the key things that the organisation will look to take forward and we'll be looking to implement arrangements now about monitoring against that on an ongoing basis. And that's in addition to obviously the range of performance reports as a scrutiny committee uh, is received on an ongoing basis from the individual teams and services themselves uh, as well. In terms of audit committee's role, I know we look at uh, the arrangements about how you scrutinise how you scrutinise the appropriateness of the council's performance arrangements overall, and obviously that can be supported by how we are actually performing itself. Um, and we've no problem in sort of sharing those reports with you. I guess it's a point in terms of what the remit of a select committee is scrutinising the actual performances of a service uh, against the audit committee, looking at the arrangements and process in place that supports that performance. Um, but of course, in terms of making that available to you when we report it, there's no problem in sharing that for, for, you, for the committee to use to inform, inform that role as well. Um, we can maybe look to formalise that if you think it would be helpful. Thank you, Mr Jones. Certainly, uh, before we began our meeting, members were talking about the overarching role of the audit committee. So perhaps uh, as, as another um, thing we could ask from this debate is that we request that it does formally go to your committee for you to consider. Is, is there any comment you'd like to make back to, to what Mr Jones has just said? I think this is, um, I think I think probably this report should go to audit committee for information because um, I, I, you know, I think any follow-up work that, that goes on in the audit committee it will be necessary for members to be fully appraised of, of what the recommendations were and why they were made. Um, the reports you describe, uh, Richard, are, are important and useful, but don't necessarily have the background behind the recommendations uh, 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 and, and the, and the, um, and the uh, reactions to those recommendations. The thing I'm just still a little bit uncertain about is what are the formal arrangements for reporting back to the Audit Committee on, on meeting performance targets. Perhaps you and I could have a talk sometime about it. Yeah, ra rather much. than uh, take up time in, in, in children and young people committee, that uh, that might be, if you could have a separate discussion and try and get some clarity there, that, that might be useful. Um, Councillor Brown, and, and then I think <coughs> I'll wind up if that's yeah, okay. Yes, thank you, me. Chair. Um, in view of um, what the uh, Chief of Officer for Education has said about um, the passenger transport unit possibly being the best um, uh, section to give us a report back on home to school transport. I mean, I think that that would be a, a very useful um, outcome of this because obviously we're responsible for the children end of, of things and I think uh, that would be very useful for, for buses and taxis. Thank you. Okay, I, I, to, to, to try and capture the, the discussions we've had then, I, I think there are a couple of things we are asking uh, to, to take forward. The one just raised by Councillor Brown there, that the, uh, a very specific examination of uh, 
home to school transport comes back here. Uh, that forms part of uh, the, our future work programme. Uh, and also on behalf of the, the chair of the audit committee that we formally ask that this is referred to audit committee for their consideration as well. Um, could, I, could I thank uh, officers who've contributed to that? We've, we've certainly had a very senior team from the officer side uh, and so thank you very much to officers for coming along. And thank you also to the Welsh Audit Office for coming along and, uh, and, and uh, sharing their thoughts with us and, and indeed answering questions. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. Uh, if we could move on then to agenda item five, um, which is an update uh, on where we are now with uh, what the report calls an intensive therapeutic fostering service for looked after children and young people. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm hoping that I can link in. I've put myself on. Um, and we're going to just. I wanted to show a few slides, if possible, just to give a bit of a wider context around the report. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, I don't know if you can read it, though. Um, I can read it. <laughs> See, not that big. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that members have had a chance to have a look at this report. Um, it's a very detailed report, and Charlotte will um, assist me with some of that detail. Um, I think um, in bringing this to members, um, it marks a very important step forward, I think, from a children's perspective, in terms of addressing some of the complexity that we have in looking after some of the children that we, we are responsible for. And a piece of work has been um, going on across the Gwent region, looking at models of support for, for children. And we have been um, partnering Blina Gwent in this endeavor to actually look at bringing together the use of the integrated care fund monies that regionally have been uh, put towards this project. Um, a lot of work has gone on in the background to, to look at how we can bring this to bear in, in the Monmouthshire context. So in terms of what the outcomes are, are, we're looking for are is that this will be a multidisciplinary uh, intensive therapeutic fostering service for looked after children and young people. Um, the pro project is proposed to be in partnership with uh, Blina Gwent and it falls under the governance of the regional partnership board. Um, there is a very strong evidence base behind this, this particular model of support for, for children. Um, and it also adds to the existing model of service that we have. Um, we're looking to host this project in Monmouthshire. Um, the reason for that is that we want to be at the forefront of that, our partners with Blina Gwent, but actually we want to be able to capitalise on as much of that progress as possible by hosting directly. Um, the service works in partnership with carers by forming these multi um, agency disciplinary teams around a young person and the family, um, looking at really creating um, an intensive support mechanism. And obviously we're looking to capitalise on bringing children potentially back from placements elsewhere to actually be um, managed more locally. Um, What's the reason for this? Well, as members will be aware, there is a very high cost uh, pressure in the children's arena. And also, when we are placing children in residential um, establishments at high cost, we're not always confident that the outcomes are, um, are good enough. Um, we've got also here an over-reliance from a fostering point of view on independent foster um, uh, carers, which come at a high cost. And we wanting to really look at realigning that so that actually we've got that expertise in-house in our own foster caring arena. Um, just in terms of, again, the case for change in terms of the money, across Blina Gwent and Monmouthshire, the full year cost of residential high cost placements, as we call them, is in the order of four and a bit million pounds. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a chunky piece of money. Mm -hmm. um, reducing or preventing out of area placements is a, is a really good incentive for us um, and actually housing looked after children in our foster arrangements is, is a, it has far better outcomes. 
Um, the ICF grant funding will sustain this project for 18 months, so it's short-term funding with any of the intermediate care funding uh, money that we get, uh, looking um, to end in um, 18 months' time. The local authority is then looking, and we are looking, to divert that funding that we will have created from managing that external pressure and those external um, placement pressures to actually cross-fund that in the longer term. What we have done is actually we've made a case for if this is successful, and we believe it is going to be successful and there is success elsewhere where, where this has happened, that actually we should be in a position where we can actually invest that into continuing this service after that point. Obviously, if that isn't the case, it'll be a matter of pulling the plug. So we have, we have some options around that. Um, this has already received um, political approval in Blind Gwent, so obviously we're looking to partner with, with our Blind Gwent colleagues. Uh, this is just a bit of information about the running costs. I'm not going to particularly go, go into that, but obviously just to, to summarise really, that the total running costs for um, the local team for a full year is in the order of 375,000, but uh, across the, um, the, the, um, the two authorities. Um, some of the risks um, that might present are around our ability to recruit staff to this project. That could be a risk, but actually these types of service models often do attract staff because it is something that is different, that it's supported in a different way, and it's a, 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 a new endeavour in, in that respect. Um, the availability of therapeutic carers could be an issue, and I'm going to ask uh, Charlotte and Mitt to explain a little bit potentially about how we might go around mitigating some of that. And then our ability to achieve the desired release of the funds to sustain the service moving forward. We are working on the premise that this does work, and there is an evidence base that says that it does. Uh, we have to see that implemented in the Monmouthshire context to see whether we can actually release release that money to, to move forward. We've also factored in, if, if we have to pull the plug, how would we share the redundancy liability that could be incurred across uh, Monmouthshire and, and Blind Gwent. And at the moment, one of the risks that we have is we, ha we haven't as yet been able to um, identify any um, suitable accommodation to house this, th this project, but we're on that. Charlotte, can I ask you to give a little bit more detailed context? So in terms of the, the risks that have been identified, both in terms of recruiting staff and in terms of recruiting therapeutic carers, we're building very much on the strong evidence base of the Tulvine and Caffili MIST project. So we're not, this isn't, this isn't a new thing. It's new for us, but it's not a, a, a new project um, in Wales. It's, um, it's proved very successful in Tulvine and uh, Caffili. So we're building on that success. Obviously, it will look slightly different across Monmouthshire and Blind and Gwent necessarily because we are a different local authority with slightly different pressures. Um, they have had the, uh, the original MIS pro project has had no difficulty at all in recruiting extremely high quality staffing. And they already have because we're working closely with um, the existing MIST project in Tulvine and Caffili. Um, very much in partnership with them as well we're able to really draw on their knowledge and expertise and they're already put putting the feelers out for us in terms of particularly the very highly specialist um, workers that are going to be needed in terms of clinical psychology so that's already um, being explored um, in, a, in a very helpful way and I, I I'm entirely confident that we'll be able to recruit successfully to all of those posts from a very high calibre of worker um, at all of the levels, both in terms of the practitioners and the support workers. And that's also, um, I've, I've recently been involved in developing the edge of care service in Monmouthshire, that this will sit alongside, it'll be part of my suite of services. We've just had a very successful recruitment campaign. We had 23 applications for one and a half posts. So the people are out there. In terms of therapeutic carers, one of the um, difficulties very often with foster carers is, is, is the landscape of fostering has changed very much in the last 15, 20 years. Um, we aren't uh, we are placing children who have experienced a lot of trauma. We've placed, we are placing children who may have experienced lots and lots of placement moves and find it very, very difficult to form um, 
trusting relationships with their adult carers. Those foster placements and foster carers can be ground down by that if they aren't given the right amount of support. Mm -hmm. So the, the amount of support that sits around that system that the child sits within is absolutely critical, both in terms of giving foster carers the confidence in us as a local authority and also in, in a whole... provide. We need to provide a secure base for foster carers so foster carers can provide a secure base for children. Again, there's real evidence that, that there are foster carers out there that are really interested in, provided they have the right support, that are really interested in coming forward, not because they are um, looking to um, replace children they may not have had, not, not traditionally, um, the kind of the traditional idea we might have of foster carers who are looking because they want to look after children, but foster carers who really want to make a difference, who really want to work with troubled children, who really want to provide that long-term secure base for children that they recognise have very high levels of need, but they can't do that on their own. They can't do that without that really robust 24-hour wraparound system that sits around them. Just to um, bring the, to, to sort of conclusion, really, that obviously we're bringing this forward um, for recommendation for, for, for your support, really, to actually implement and, and take this forward. Obviously, the money is um, separate to, to the authority. Um, and I'm um, happy to answer any questions that members may have. Uh, thank you very much. Just to uh, reassure you, Ms. Boyce Boothroyd, uh, you, you talked about the complexity of the report. Um, in our pre-meeting, it, it was very clear that members have studied it in some depth, and you, you might be in for some quite challenging questions now. <laughs> so, uh, over to members. Uh, Joe, uh, Councillor Watkins. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the report, and it does sound a very exciting project, and certainly from the costing side of things, I can definitely see how these very small number of very high cost placements are an area that we really do need to look at carefully. So the report mostly talks about the finance and the management arrangements and those sides of things. What I would actually really like to know about a little bit more is what we're actually planning to do with these challenging children. It's talked about therapeutic foster care, so what are the sorts of therapy that we're actually going to be put in place? I'd also like to ask, what's the impact going to be on schooling? Because are they going to go into specialist provision within county? Are we going to put them into our mainstream schools? If that's going to happen, that will have, again, a knock-on effect in terms of what provision needs to happen in the schools and how then the schools may need to manage that. So. And I also think about it in terms of our corporate parenting role, in terms of the fact that these are children who are in care, they've been put into a residential placement, it's very secure, there's a stability there if they're there for a longer period of time. So we're then going to be taking them back into county very strongly. I want us to just to be very clear that we are, have got their needs very much at the heart of what we're looking at rather than it being a cost-cutting exercise. I want to know that this is in the benefit of the children, not, not for finance. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, this is not a cost-cutting exercise. <laughs> this is about quality uh, outcomes for children, for our looked-after population. Um, it's interesting that you say about um, residential being secure. Yes, sometimes it is secure at the high end of security, but actually our... Our evidence suggests that the outcomes that we're um, achieving for people in very, very high cost situations, often you know, outside of our boundary uh, or, the, or the, um, the authority and where people have lived, are not good. It's not value for money and it is not good outcomes for individuals. The idea that we can bring children back into a Monmouthshire looked after setting with the appropriate, and I'll ask Charlotte to talk about the, thera the therapy bit, it's about giving, people, giving children a, a life in Monmouthshire. Um, so this isn't about cost-cutting. I suppose, in a sense, we might have, you know, I can understand where that might have come from. Clearly, we have a pressure in children's services, and we have a pressure that is evident around the, the finances. This is a method of reducing some of that, but actually adding great value and making sure that there are better outcomes for children. In terms of this, we're not talking high numbers here. 
can't remember what the number is, about eight, eight or nine or ten. Yes, it is, I knew it was below. Um, so we're not talking, we're not, it's not as if we're going to be flooding, um, you know, um, the, the, the school sector. Obviously, these children may have very specific needs. We'll have to look and work in partnership with schools and other partners to actually identify how are those children going to be integrated into um, you know, schooling, if that is appropriate, or, or, or whatever else is. It. Now, I would want to reassure people that that level of detail is there in terms of, but it isn't about saving money, it's about enhancing our offer so that actually we're in a better position with our looked after population. I'll ask Charlotte to talk about the therapeutic bit because I think that's quite important. Every single child will need to be considered in their own system, in their own individual context. Um, I couldn't possibly give you a, a description of the therapeutic input that's going to be needed for any individual child because that will be need, need to be explored with that child, with their support system. But the kind of therapies that um, the MIST uses are the creative therapies, play therapy. It's a psychologically informed service. So they use a network consultation approach. It's very much about upskilling and supporting a therapeutic foster placement. And by therapeutic foster placement, what we mean are um, foster carers who are given additional training, additional support, so they um, understand the impact of trauma, they understand the impact that ch these children very often have very interesting patterns of attachment, for example, so they don't readily trust, um, and that can make their behaviour very difficult to manage for foster carers. Um, one of the key things is this concept of wrap wraparound care, so foster carers never feel that they are on their own, um, it's, it's in order to make a child feel safe enough that they can invest in a family, they need to they need to have a secure base. They need to know that the boundaries are there. They need to know that the nurturing love isn't enough. We often say, you know, all children need is enough love. That's not actually the case. They need that secure base. They need those, the, the boundaries. But for foster carers to be able to do that, the foster carers themselves need to sit within a support system. And that involves it needs education. Education is an absolutely critical partner in this. What the research tells us if the, is if the educational placement is secure, then very often the placement where the child lives, can also, whether that's at home or a residential unit or a foster placement, that is also um, much more likely to be secure. Mm -hmm. So the relationship between education and this project is going to be absolutely critical. Um, there is a psychologist as part of the model. There are therapists as part of the model. There are social workers as part of the model. There are family support workers as, as part of the model. So it really is. And, and one of the key things is always having somebody at the end of the phone, be it at 2 o'clock in the morning, if, you, if something's kicking off and you just need somebody to say, it's going to be OK, I'll be out there in the morning, we, we, can fix, we can sort this. Just that containment that's needed both for the child and for the foster carer. Does that give you enough? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's, it's good to, to hear the talk of wraparound care, uh, which is certainly music to my ear in a, in a committee which is supposed to look after the needs of children and young people in their total. Um, Ms. Eilert has, has pointed out that it's been some time since, as a committee, we gave thought to the work being done by the team around the family. Um, and um, obviously with the consent of committee, maybe that's something that could go into the future work program and we could um, receive a report on, on that because things are moving on at a rate of knots in terms of children within families in lots of contexts. So um, maybe that's something we could take forward. Uh, Councillor Thomas, uh, sorry, and then Councillor Jones. Councillor Thomas. I, I, thanks, Chair. I'd just like to say I'm, I'm very reassured by, by everything I've heard today. I read the report uh, over the last couple of days, uh, and obviously m my main issue, obviously, uh, and, and everybody's issue, and yours included, is, is the best care of those youngsters, and, and it, it's not coming down to a, a balance sheet. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that, that has to come into the, um, the equation. Um, You've reassured me as well that, that uh, we can be confident that there will be wraparound care because obviously these, these children are incredibly 
challenging by the nature of their, their background. Certainly, as having been on Looked After Children now for um, just over a year and a half, I've, I've been impressed by the work of your senior officer, Jane Rogers, and, and her team um, in terms of, of, of what they do. Um, but also, as well, I, I think we need to catch up, in a sense, with, Bly, with not Blind and Gwent, with, with um, Torvine and with Caffili. And Caffili and Torvine do lead to, seem to lead on, on a broad range of issues across the, in the spectrum, not just um, looking after, you know, looking after uh, children. And the other thing I would say is I welcome it. I, I'm not terribly happy with children having to be sent long distances and, and then monitoring them in a sense but almost by re remote control i think when they, they're within the authority um we can actually keep in a sense keep keep an eye on them uh, but also in terms of certainly talking to um foster uh, carers and and talking to fo foster children last last saturday councillor penny jones and i were at, at hillston park penny on the rafts and, and me climbing a wall but um <laughs> I normally climb the wall anyway, but um, but what I'd like to say is it's obviously, you know, seeing those children, yeah, I taught a long time ago, I've got three kids of my own who've grown up, but obviously you can see that, that many of them um, are quite challenging, uh, but they've had very challenging backgrounds, and the more that they are passed on, certainly speaking to a foster care in another uh, context, uh, they'd had to give up on, on a teenage girl, they just could not keep going. But then that is another brick in the wall in terms of the trauma uh, for that child. So many people don't experience trauma in their early lives, like death of parents um, or marital breakup, uh, and, and they believe that life is hunky-dory and, and mum and dad are there and grandparents to support them. But for lots of children who don't have that, uh, and whatever we do, it isn't, it isn't in reality quite the same as ha having your parents there. Um, so every, anything we can do to actually improve that and, and to have less movement. And obviously, I, I, I know, speaking to Jane, that that's something you try to um, avoid, but that creates trauma. So, I, you know, I welcome this, and I, I, I think it's a good move forward myself. That's, that's my personal feeling. Our Cabinet Member, Councillor Jones, has caught my eye. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to follow on from the previous councillor's comments and, uh, and, and to, to reiterate, in fact, that last Saturday, I think we met some children, one of whom had been brought down by a residential care man uh, manager um, from Manchester area to join in the Monmouthshire Day. And that was how important Monmouthshire was to her. And they were driving straight back afterwards, which is, you know, some commitment. But how much more appropriate would be to have that child within Monmouthshire. So um, there was a couple of others, and one other example was a lot of placements. Now, if we could have this wraparound care, it would be so important, would reduce the number of placements as well, and I think that's something we've got to think of. Just to, to point out that, you know, with the um, Torvine were independently um, evaluated, as you can see in the report, and at that time, their, their placements, residential placements, were reduced from 15, as nothing like that, but to um, consistently below five, which is so important, despite the rise in the number of looked after children. So it does work. And, you know, as, as you say, if it doesn't, then we'll pull the, the plug. But at the moment, it seems, you know, it, it is a good project. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Powell. And Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we were talking about, a lot about the family and the home, and you also mentioned about how important education is and um, uh, 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 Councillor over here said about them going out of, of our county. Um, we do have uh, a place for boys in their teens, but we have no provision within Monmouthshire for teenage girls, and they must have to go further distances to find education for specially needed children. Um, is there anything that you can... Um, give us hope that maybe somewhere there's going to be provision for teenage girls um, uh, similar to um, Mountain House. Is that one for you, uh, Mr. McLean? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well. uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Powell. You're absolutely right that at the moment our um, special school for uh, children with social emotional behaviour difficulties is for only boys of secondary age. Um, it was part of our ALN review um, that we undertook over the, the past period of time. 
Um, at the moment, most girls um, who present with those needs uh, end up in the independent setting. It happens to be in county quite often because uh, Talaka is up in the uh, near Monmouth, um, but that's clearly not what we would like. I think one of the things which we are very clear about is very often when children present with behaviour, this is a discussion we had with head teachers yesterday, uh, the initial presentation is of behaviour and that's the initial concern but what is often the case is that underlying that there are significant attachment or potentially undiagnosed learning behaviours um, that are actually the cause of that presentation. So we've got to work much earlier with our schools, much earlier with our teachers and our heads and so on to make sure that we're finding the appropriate provision for those children. That might not be SEBD provision. Um, it might be a different type of uh, education for children with autism and so on, that type of thing. There's a whole range of things which we might, we might think about there. Um, the other thing just to, to say is that sometimes um, out of county can be a somewhat misleading phrase. Out of county could be a mile down the road. Um, in county could be an hour from Abergavenny to Chepstow. So we just need to think about where we are placing our children and that it's most accessible. And going back to the earlier comments around transport, that that's as uh, effective as it can be too. Thank you very much. Councillor Brown and then Mr Fowler. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm um, all, all in favour of um, uh, going for um, uh, a different arrangement that's um, best for the child. And obviously, you know, the love and care within a, a foster home is is preferable to um, a residential um, setting but um, I'm thinking about in terms of um, just wondered why we didn't partner with Tor Vine since they seem to have the expertise in this area and how we will link him with them to ensure that we have the e expertise. Um, the other question I've got is is that um, I'm concerned about the um, foster carer themselves. I mean, you actually said that they would have wraparound care, but there's nothing in this report or, or no um, financial aspect to provide these uh, foster carers who are actually um, dealing with children with um, complex needs some respite themselves. You know, because obviously, if they're dealing with this on a 24-7 basis, it is very demanding. And one of the um, pros of residential care is, is that this is shared among different staff. And I appreciate that there's support there um, from people who aren't residential, you know, in terms of the local delivery team. Um, but that's not necessarily the same as having somebody... Um, you know, physically there looking after them. And I just wondered whether this aspect had been um, thoroughly thought about because, um, you know, I have concerns, um, for example, in relation to people I know of in the, uh, in the local community who are uh, struggling with care in relation to other um, people and having problems getting care packages in, in place quick enough. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, wouldn't want to... Um, get to a point where foster carers are finding it too much because they're not actually getting any respite break at all from the um, very demanding uh, job that they've got and obviously very rewarding job um, uh, but challenging as well so I wondered if you could uh, cover that particular aspect thank you Thank you, Councillor Brown. If I just pick up the Torvine bit and then I'll ask Charlotte to um, deal with the foster care a bit. Torvine and Caffili have had this in their model of delivery for some time. So actually we're in a position where uh, we can learn from them and it's great that they've actually forged ahead and been able to give some of that evidence base. Um, Blind Gwent and ourselves didn't have this model, hence why we're partnering with them. Um, just to mention as well as um, uh, Councillor Thomas mentioned Jane, uh, uh, giving apologies for Jane today, she's at the Heads of Service for Wales um, event today and obviously we prioritise that because actually have lots of conversations about these things there as well. Um, so we, we learn from the fact that others have gone first and actually we have a very good relationship with our other um, authorities, the five Heads of Service and the regional working is very, very strong, hence why we've been in a sense being able to get on the back of this um, th through, through, through the fact that they went first. I'd just like to add as well, um, we are learning, we are partnering with them. We're, we're not going into a partnership in terms of delivery with them because they're all already up and running. 
we're going into a partnership in terms of delivery with, with Blind and Gwent because they're not. The last meeting we had on this, where we came up with the name, um, was with Torvine um, and a, a very short term um, fix for the problem of accommodation will be actually sitting in their building if we can't find anywhere else. So we really are working very closely with Torvine and they are um, supporting the development of this. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's all but a, a joint collaborative event in, in, in all but kind of a funding arrangement, really. Um, in, in terms of the support to foster carers, the simple fact of the matter is if we don't provide them with sufficient support and sufficient respite, this model will not work. So it's absolutely not in our interest to look at um, things like, and, and this is all part of the model, enhanced payments for therapeutic foster carers, um, built-in respite, and a highly responsive support team that will be available on a wraparound basis to support those foster carers. Yeah, Chair. So basically, the 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 model and the costing includes includes this built-in respite care, does it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, some of this has already been covered, but it, it comes back down to the business um, side of it again. And um, under three point eight is where I found it. Uh, but this partnership with Blind Now Grant. Um, as, as two authorities, we're funded widely differently and we feel different. And I just wonder why we're strategically partnering with Blino Grantors and not other partners to go with. Or is, as the kind of suggests in the report, other people have done it and we're the only ones left. And I don't know if that makes it the fit just because we're the ones left on the floor, whether that makes us strategically right for each other or not. I, I do not know. So I, I'd like to explore that a bit further. And, and then in the options appraisal, considering that Torvine and Caffili are successfully doing it, and I think Torvine have had their project for 12 years or something, um, where's the option to just buy into something that's up and running rather than having to create whole structures, whereas we could just buy into something and get going more readily? Uh, I, I, I wonder why that option appraisal wasn't there. In terms of the fit, um, why, you know, I think your, your point about we're funded differently, we are, our populations are different, our looked after children are, I'm not saying they're the same, but you know, that we will have a proportion of looked after children, blind are going to have many more looked after children than, than we do. I think the strategic fit comes at the regional level. So actually we work in partnership with each of those local authorities through the regional partnership collaborative, through children's partnership and through the regional um, uh, program board. Um, we partner people at different times for different things. I think the evidence base behind this is, is sound and solid and we've had an opportunity with the integrated um, care fund money being released to be able to jump onto that. If we weren't having that integrated care fund money that would have been much more of a difficult, difficult ask for us. Um, in terms of your second point about why don't we uh, why, why isn't it in the options appraisal about, as about you know being able to just buy into Torvine? I think we have to look at this as being, you know, it's it's host that 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 idea that it's a regional approach but locally delivered. We have to be able to grow our own foster carers that have those capabilities and that capacity to be able to support our population. We have got models in in certainly the adult world where we've got a wider collaboration around some of these things. That might come. It may be that in the future we're able to collaborate as a sort of Gwent community. But as we are a little bit behind, as our Torvine, we need to get up to that base. Um, I'm not sure it would have been an option for us to buy into that service um, because, in effect, we have to grow our own and, and recruit our own foster carers on site in Monmouthshire. Asking Torvine to do that on our behalf just because they've been doing it and they're doing it successfully, I accept, um, might not have worked for us. Um, it could be that we should have put that in and then discounted it. I'm, I'm not sure that if that was part of our, our rationale, mainly because it's, it really isn't an option. You'd be putting it in and then discounting it straight away. So I hope that answers you, your point. OK, have we got any further? Yes, uh, Councillor Woodhouse. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say well done on the success of um, 
the, the recruiting of, of additional carers to, to obviously this scheme will be dependent on that. Um, so this follows on from that. Um, I'm just looking at 3.5. You've mentioned quite often, quite a lot about Torvine and Cavilli's success, um, but you also refer to and elsewhere. Now, how many? You know, can you tell us roughly, however, how many schemes there are in other places, or um, you know, that reference is a little bit sort of unclear as to how many of this type of um, schemes are actually in operation. Thank you, Councillor Woodhouse. I think we'll put our hands up to that and say, I think the and elsewhere is probably a bit of a generic um, um, addition. I don't think we sit here knowing exactly what is elsewhere, if, if I'm perfectly honest. Having said that, I know that there are lots of models of interventions across the UK that will be called all sorts of different things that will be delivering a, a, along yeah. very similar lines. Um, so it's fair to say and elsewhere, but they might be called different things and have slightly different tailoring. Um, I think Certainly, in terms of the Gwent region, we will have five um, once Blina Gwent and ourselves are up and running. Um, and we're always looking at learning from elsewhere, but I think, you know, substantially it's about, it's about the five and definitely us two coming and, and joining that, that, that endeavour um, as we move forward. Okay. Um, without further hands up, let's wrap up this particular part of our morning's work then. Um, Perhaps in summary, we could ask for a couple of things moving forward. The first is, as I've already mentioned, uh, a further report about the current work of the team around the family, uh, because I think that, that remit has changed and developed, and uh, uh, it would be good to get a report on exactly what they are doing. Um, I think um, this is not our first report on the development of this service. You've still got some work to do, and so I would ask that as that moves forward, you bring us another report, and perhaps that issue about support for foster parents is something that we, you could be quite specific about, because certainly in the time I've chaired this committee, we've moved very rapidly from a situation where we were over-reliant on agency foster parents to recruiting our own, and now looking to develop our own really specialist foster parents. That's a long journey in a very short time. And so I, if, if when you come back to us to further report, if you could, if you could perhaps mull on that one particularly as well, it's something that, that interests me. Um, before I move on to asking for support for the report's recommendation, uh, I wonder if I could have a little grouse from the chair and ask Miss Eilid to take forward, uh, looking at, uh, at number four in this report, the options appraisal. Um, I've mentioned from the chair in the past that recommendations come from members rather than from officers. Uh, and here we've got another report with a range of options, uh, one of which is recommended to us. Uh, I think that officers will have heard our debate today and come to the conclusion that we would have made that recommendation ourselves. Uh, and please, moving forward, it's not just for officers here now, that's why I ask Miss Eilid to take it forward, uh, perhaps raise it with the Chief Executive, that uh, we make the recommendations as members uh, and uh, the options are put to us fairly, and I'm afraid at the end of the day you have to rely on us to come to the right conclusions, which I think generally we do, because we do get very good advice in our reports. But if I could make that quite specific re uh, comment, please. Uh, moving then on to the recommendation, which is simply, in essence, that we take this forward, um, I think from our comments universally this morning, I think we can simply say that you have the approval of this committee to do that. Uh, and if I could thank you for uh, bringing the report to us and for answering our questions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, moving forward then to agenda item six, uh, and this is one for Mr. McLean. Um, and before I ask him to uh, talk to us about outcomes for children um, from when they start school up to when they reach the end of Key Stage 3, 
members will be aware that we have not yet heard anything on the outcomes of external exams at Key Stage 4 and Post 16. Could I remind you and, and ask you generally to remind members that there is uh, a members um, event about that and the analysis of Post 16 and Key Stage 4 next week. Uh, it's for all members, but obviously I would hope that members of this committee can attend. Having given that a little plug, uh, Mr. McLean. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you for that uh, for that plug as well. I was going to mention that uh, in my opening comments. Um, I think it's slightly different uh, this year that we've decided to take uh, to a full member seminar the outcomes at Key Stage 4. Um, what uh, myself and the chair talked about was doing that in the first instance because all members will have a, a view about their local school and it's right that we, we share that broadly with all members. Um, but what we were very clear about was that the detailed analysis, uh, vulnerable groups, um, different cohorts and so on, will come to this committee uh, for the November meeting. So uh, I hope that reassures members. The other part is, of course, that um, we've had the first um, cut of the, of the uh, formalised statistics, but they are still moving and still changing. So uh, we have this uh, rather kind of lengthy process which starts on exam results day uh, in August, but won't be completed until mid-December when the results are actually finally uh, uh, validated by Welsh Government and really in terms of sharing the outcomes and some of those um, vulnerable groups that's the first point of time that we can do that. Um, but as the Chair has said uh, I'm here today to talk about um, the outcomes for our children at the foundation phase, Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 uh, uh, and it struck me whilst I was preparing for this meeting that uh, we've spent a long time talking about uh, changes to the accountability framework I think you had a very useful presentation from Ed Price at the EAS at your September meeting um, around some of those changes. But this is the first report that you've had as a committee where you can see the impact of those changes and the differential in, the term, in terms of the type of information that we can present to you. Um, I was reflecting with um, head teachers yesterday that actually this is quite a significant challenge and quite a significant change for us in Monmouthshire. Um, uh, a number of those um, head teachers reflected that governors had felt very similarly uh, in terms of the way that information is now presented. Um, we spent um, too long in Eston recovery, um, and I think all of that process, the recovery board, the leadership of this organisation, um, and consequently select and cabinet, um, were informed all the time about the importance of benchmarking quartiles, around progress against the median. All of these terms became very much part of how we felt and thought around our education performance. Um, and at a one, uh, one clean swipe, uh, all of that um, has been removed. So it is different. Um, so we'll see that now as we talk through um, the various stages. So much of the first page of the report is actually um, setting out um, those changes and what the expected levels are at the various um, ends of learning. So at the end of the foundation phase, our expected level, um, and in crude terms that's for the average child, would be outcome five. For our more able children, we'd be looking for their attainment at outcome six. At key stage two, which is that critical indicator at the end of primary school, we're expecting children to meet, we switch now from outcomes to levels, um, to achieve a level four. Our more able children um, will probably achieve a level five. Some exceptionally able children will probably achieve level six in some specific subjects, but highly unlikely uh, in the core subject indicator, which is that compound indicator. Um, and then we move to key stage three, which is at the end of year nine. Um, an increasingly interesting and yet difficult uh, point of measurement. Um, many secondary schools have taken the decision to start key stage four a year early so that we know in some of our schools um, they make their choices um, at the end of year eight rather than at the end of year nine. Um, I think we're yet to see a cohort work its way through um, to understand the benefit that that has but I suspect that the changes that Welsh Government has introduced around early entry examinations may actually impact on those decisions. So I think if you were going to move to a three-year key stage four and you had the opportunity to take examinations often during those three years, it would be a greater benefit rather than having one single attempt um, at the end of a two-year linear programme. So I think we'll see a shift in that uh, as things progress. 
it has had an impact on key stage three outcomes because clearly that judgment is being made in essence when you've already started key stage four. So that is slightly problematic for us. So if we move on, um, page two again uh, is really considering those things which have stopped in terms of the information that will be provided. Key, uh, page three then covers off what I've just talked around in terms of where things are expected and so on. And at the bottom of that page, you can see the number of children in each of our cohorts. In the foundation phase, 901. Um, key stage two, 899. And at key stage three, 814. So if we look um, at the foundation phase, now this is a report that's been generated by the EAS. So the pattern repeats itself for foundation phase two and three. Um, first thing to say about the foundation phase, though, is that there was a significant change in the way that assessment was undertaken with regards to the foundation phase. I wrote to all parents of children at the end who would be at the end of year stage two last year. Uh, I'm going to advise them of that fact. I think, and you can see straight away, um, midway down uh, page four on that um, uh, the the graph at the top there, you can see that. Uh, there's very clearly delineated break from what previous assessment had taken place. Um, and you can also see that there has been a significant fallback in our performance, but also in the Welsh performance. So you can see actually properly a harder assessment is resulting in fewer children um, achieving the expected level. The table below that illustrates those, the proportion of children who are achieving the expected um, and who are achieving the expected level plus one. And you can see mapped through there the Welsh performance and our own targets. But I think the most valuable tables are on the top of page five. Um, so you can see there that, as expected, um, as I've just set out, um, our performance across all of the key um, indicators has declined. Um, what I would say and what I would ask you to do is to look how closely they've achieved um, towards their target. So, you know, we know that our schools know our children well, they're targeting effectively, and then those schools are achieving that. Um, there is, I think now we have moved ever so slightly closer to the Welsh average line than we might have been previously. And I think some uh, data that I've seen shows that we perhaps might have implemented those changes slightly more harshly in Monmouthshire than some of our local partners. But without the full detail of that, that's difficult for me to say definitively. Um, and I probably shouldn't have made any reference to comparability anyway. <laughs> but you can see there that uh, that's uh, an important thing that's happened. Um, and again, that's echoed back again um, at the expected level plus one. But I do think that the proximity in terms of the... Um, the target setting is important. At the moment, we have the gender differences, but not the FSM. So that's all that's reported. And that's at the bottom of page five. You'll see that there has been um, a theme of a widening um, gap in terms of uh, gender performance between boys and girls. Um, however, um, we are still have a narrower gap than the Welsh gap. So that's positive. Um, when we come to see um, we will be expecting to see that gap close again now in terms of our own performance uh, and working with your own um, schools, of schools you might be governors of, that's one of the areas that I would suggest would be a question that you might want to pursue there. It will become much more a system and a process whereby the, the richness of the information locally is really important. So it will be about governors being able to have real assurance about the value of the self-evaluation process, the school development plan, and understanding what more localised targets are, rather than broad brush national outcomes at the end of key stages. As we move on to page six, we look at key stage two. Um, key stage two um, assessment has remained the same, uh, and you see there... Um, uh, Continued improvement um, at Key Stage 2, which I think is very significant for us. So if you look to the bottom of uh, page 6, you'll see that across all subject areas, including Welsh, um, Welsh is more volatile as a subject in Monmouthshire than other places, simply because of the size of the cohort. We've only got two schools, and uh, the school in the south of the county, Escolafin, is a small school. So that does have an impact in terms of the variability of outcomes year on year. But you can see that across all expected levels, um, improvement, which is very positive. Um, and again, at the top of page seven, you can see there that um, we're making progress again at the expected level plus one. 
One of the challenges for us quite clearly, and one which I've articulated to members in the past, is that we make sure that the, the children who are achieving the higher levels at the end of Key Stage 2 go on to achieve those at the end of Key Stage 4. However, a key thing for us to remember um, is that um, the assessment at the end of Key Stage 2 is teacher assessment. So there is um, an element of subjectivity within that. Um, that's not to suggest that there can sometimes be a, or cannot sometimes be a subjectivity in exam marking. It is less though. So teachers may recognise a child has achieved something once um, and that will give them the nudge up into the higher levels and so on. When it comes to actual external examinations, um, that's more difficult. So there are some variances between external examinations and teacher assessments. But still very, very positive to see that um, progress is being made um, in terms of the expected level and the expected level plus one um, at key stage two. Again, boys and girls, we're seeing this pattern repeated from the foundation phase around the gender gap opening, um, although, again, the gender gap is narrower than um, the Welsh average, um, with the exception of Welsh first language, where it is wider. Uh, interestingly, although that has closed significantly in Monmouthshire from 20.5% last year down to 8% this year. Um, if we move on to Key Stage 3, which will be the final area which I cover today, um, Key Stage 3 is really important uh, and it's a really important indicator. It's the last marker we have before children do their Key Stage 4. It has been a significant area of concern for us in the past um, and you can see that that uh, blue line at the top of page uh, 8 is on a, an upward trajectory over the past four years. Um, this year, um, at the expected level, we have seen increases at um, all subjects with the exception of maths. Um, but at those expected levels plus one and plus two, we have seen fall back this year, and that's on the top of page nine. So you can see there that all bar maths have increased um, at level five. Obviously, we don't have any Welsh language secondary schools, so that's why that one is clear. Um, but then all bar maths at level seven um, have declined. So that's something for us to be aware of when we think about this cohort sitting there um, their GCSEs in 2020. Um, we just need to be aware, will we see the echo of that come through in those in the percentage of children achieving the highest grades at that point in the future? Um, I think the maths is really positive. 44.5% um, of children achieving a level seven. If you're achieving a level seven in year nine, then really, you know, we should be looking for A's um, when you um, are finishing GCSEs. Um, we have seen, I think, the benefit of cluster working across our schools. This is something I've mentioned previously. Certainly in the Abergavenny cluster, the maths team from the secondary school go out into the primary schools. They work very closely with primary school colleagues around numeracy um, and maths-based study. Um, what that has done is a given primary colleagues greater assurance when they are grading children. And for instance, last year, we did see a cohort of children come through into secondary school with a level six in maths at the end of primary school, which is a really, really significant step forward. Um, gender differences um, have again, common theme now this year, have increased for indicators, but are again lower than the Welsh gender gap. That's um, a, a very quick run over the top um, of the paper. Um, it will become very interesting now as we move through into the implementation of successful futures um, because we will see a change again in how children are assessed. So we will have to get used to a different set of uh, um, indicators and uh, well actually a whole new lexicon in terms of assessment and in terms of progress of children um, in uh, their primary settings. But um, I think this shows us consistently um, demonstrating high levels of achievement um, within our primary phase. It also shows that continued improvement at key stage through in secondary. Um, I think there are some areas that we need to think around in terms of teaching and learning within our schools. Um, at the moment, schools are going through the process of categorisation. Um, we will wait for that to be completed before we form a view around where we think our system is. Um, but I'd be open to any questions that the uh, committee might have. Um, thank you very much, Mr McLean. Um, Councillor Brown. 
Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it is very useful to have um, this uh, com comprehensive um, detail. Um, it seems as if there was some sort of change, was there, in terms of um, uh, the previous year, and, and that was the reason why, and I'm not quite sure what that was. Um, the other question I've got is, is that um, you mentioned that at the key stages, some of it is teacher assessment and some of it is exam. Could you tell me which key stages is teacher assessment and which is exam? The other third question I've got is um, to do with, um, uh, you know, changes as a result of the curriculum changes and the recommendations of Donaldson about sampling and national sampling and so forth. And will we have this type of information available in future to uh, monitor performance or what exactly will, will happen uh, with that regard? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, the three stages that I've just described this morning are all teacher assessment. Um, so foundation phase, key stage two, three are all teacher assessed. Key stages four and five are assessed by virtue of external examinations. Um, and um, key stage four in Wales is entirely by the WJEC. Um, key stage five, schools have an option um, to pursue other examination boards, as far as I understand still. Um, so that's the, the differential in terms of that. In terms of Donaldson, um, I think... That is still a work in progress. Um, I know when we had colleagues here uh, from the EAS who set out the, where we are in terms of the, the rollout, um, they are working on their six areas of learning and experience. Within those six areas, there are a number of what matter statements. Within those what matter statements, there are a number of progress steps. I don't yet know how we will be reported on, on those and what that will look like when it comes back into this setting. Um, but for the foreseeable future, i.e. for the next two to years, I'm sure we will continue to receive um, the updates as we've received them today. Okay. Uh, Mr Fowler. Hi, um, thank you. Um, it's interesting to look at the data when we haven't got the comparisons of, our, of the other local authorities, um, which makes me have to think about the data more. Because previously, if we could compare to Caradigian and be somewhere close by, we were a similar authority and you felt reassured by that. So without those comparators now, you're having to kind of look at the figures solely on their own. Um, and so I started looking at um, the expected level plus one, so the level fives at key stage two. Um, and then I start looking at, at those as being whole authority averages and seeing, say, English at 59% and mathematics at 58.3, as an average of all schools across our authority, that means we've got a jolly lot of above-average children living in Monmouthshire. And it's just, it's hard to see how across, is it 31 primaries? 30, 30 primaries to get that kind of average figure when you know that some have probably fallen below. Then you think that, that means that some schools must have had 70% at the plus one or something to get an average looking like that. And it, it just makes you wonder um, and want to see the school level data that we can't look at, but it, it, there's nothing to contextualize it now. And it's, it's seeing those results and not being able to compare. And it's, I don't know if we need more commentary on that. Okay. Uh, and I don't know what shape that should take, but it's seeing an average of 59 just looks scary. Yes, um, yes. I, I think that's a, a very fair point. And I think when I um, was first engaged with uh, the education service, um, I used to speak to my colleague internally, to Sharon, and to Nicola Allen, who some of you remember was our principal challenge advisor at, uh, at that time, and actually say, you know, these are very high numbers. We're now talking in excess of 50%. So one in two children is if the language in the report is to be accurate more able you know and that does seem like a high figure what came back actually was interesting and was that sense that actually if you think about the demographics of Monmouthshire actually would your expectations have been at that level anyway so should we expect to have that number of children I think for me um, the um, the the key issues for me are that um, if we are 
placing reliance and we have increasingly robust moderation um, arrangements across clusters and so on. And if we're placing reliance on our teachers' assessments, how do we make sure that those type of figures at the end of key stage um, two translate much better to the end of key stage four? Um, one of the things which uh, we will bring uh, to a future select committee is some of the um, analysis um, that things such as the Fisher Family Trust data allows us to see, which maps through the progress that children make uh, from the end of Key Stage 2 to the end of Key Stage 4. It is a really important marker, uh, and in fact the Welsh Government and consequently ESTIN um, use a marker which is called the Model 2B um, to give our secondary schools an expectation of performance based on what is achieved um, at the end of Key Stage 2. Arguably, um, it might make my life a lot easier if, there are, if our outcomes at the end of Key Stage 2 were lower. Um, it's one of those perverse things about a system. Um, and that's, that is one of the things which, in trying to remove some of this um, very, very high-stakes high accountability from the system, that's the type of perverse... Um, outcome and perverse incentive that Welsh Government is actually trying to remove from it. So, yeah, it is a really valid point, uh, Mr Fowler, and I think it's one that we are conscious of, but it is one that I think we feel assured about because of the moderation processes that exist. Councillor Thomas, and then Councillor Brown. Yes, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Mr McLean, for, for the report. I, I, I'd share that concern. And... One of my uh, main concerns always, uh, not to in any way um, devalue teacher assessment, uh, but, it, but it is more variable across a large number of schools. And at the end of the day, uh, when you get to public exams at Key Stage 4, which are the exams that obviously decide whether you're going to go on into sixth form and go to higher education, etc., they are externally set and they are externally moderated. Uh, and obviously the children sit uh, a common exam and, and certainly over the last few years, coursework has, has more or less gone from, from the current government's view that they didn't feel it, it, it was reliable. And, and I must say, personally, I, I, I had some doubt sometimes about um, teacher assessed coursework when it actually came in, the, the variation and the fact that um, however much you try and exclude it, there is a halo effect when you're assessing Johnny Jones that you teach every day, you know him well, you know his mum and dad, you might even be <laughs> friendly with him, etc. But apart from that, you know the child, and you say, oh, it's, it's got to be a level five and a level six, etc. Uh, external exams, in my opinion, are, are more reliable. And unless we're in a position, it'll be interesting on next Tuesday, and I, I'll certainly be here. But personally, what I want to see, obviously, are, are key stage two outcomes translating in, into key stage four outcomes. Certainly when I work for WJEC, um, I've had a lot of candidates in England, key stage two results from England, we use that as a projection right through in, into key stage four and, and often there's a very strong correlation uh, of outcome. And if, if that's not happening in, in Monmouthshire schools, well obviously it, it, it needs to happen, doesn't it? And at the end of the day, um, <laughs> We live in a very affluent county and, and with lots of affluent, very well-supported children. And I know we've, we've got a long tail, but really we should be doing well in, in terms of um, the background, the aspiration, the qualifications that lots of parents have, which, which do obviously influence children and, and do actually, in a sense, help them in, in, in the sort of earth that they've they grown up in. So, you know, we should be having good outcomes. Mr. McLean uh, and then Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Just one of the, um, and I know I'm often conscious of the fact that uh, when I sit in front of members, I talk about all of the changes that are happening in Welsh education. And sometimes I fear that uh, that might actually sound like I'm trying to uh, obfuscate, um, you know, performance in some way because by saying, you know, it's not comparable to last year or whatever else. But I think, let me, another example of that. Um, Children also sit nationally marked reading and numeracy and procedural tests when they are in um, uh, junior school or uh, primary school. Um, historically, we would be able um, to use that as a guide, and only as a guide because they are assessing different things, 
to correlate, um, you know, if a school is reporting 60% of children are in um, achieving level, expect level plus one, we would then expect to see a correlation of that school's performance in the national tests. And it might, so long as it was broadly in Q1 or Q2, then you'd be confident that there was a, a read across there. It would give you a degree of assurance. However, from this year on, um, the national reading and writing tests are now adaptive. So the children do them on a computer and the test changes for that individual child um, as they answer certain questions. So there is now no longer a standardised score that we can work from. So that barometer has been changed as well. So things are changing rapidly um, and it is interesting, but I absolutely, you know, the fundamental point is that we need to ensure that the good outcomes we get at the end of Key Stage 2 translate to better outcomes at the end of Key Stage 4. Yeah, um, I think um, I was a little bit concerned about what you just said about, um, uh, effectively, I think you're talking about the PISA tests, are you, or not? No, no, because there is a, is a recommendation about uh, PISA on numeracy and literacy, the international tests that... Uh, uh, I think Donaldson has made a recommendation that it's only once every three years, which, um, you know, is is a concern. And just wondered what your views on that, that uh, particular aspect were. And also, um, you mentioned about the test changing, and that's why um, we're seeing these downward uh, fig figures. And could you explain how they've changed and why they've changed? Because I, I didn't really, don't think I got an answer to that originally. Thank you. Fine, thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, uh, PISA is very high stakes to judge your educational performance on. Um, when you look um, at the schools that are very high performing in PISA, then there are a range of different um, systems and different approaches to education within those schools and education systems. And I think it is very different, you know, clearly the approach taken by the current um, administration um, in Cardiff is that, you know, um, an upward trend in our PISA outcomes would be highly um, highly valued, I think. Um, I think it is difficult on a three-year cycle, and PISA only tests certain things in a certain way. So we've got to, again, with any assessment, you have to take that into account. Um, the tests that I, referring to, that I was referring to were the national um, reading and writing. So there are um, reading, writing, um, numeracy, and procedural papers that children sit. Um, <coughs> they get scored on a standardized basis anything above between, I'm going to say, 85 and 116 is the normal range. In excess of 116 would be a more able child. Uh, beneath 85 would indicate um, a learning need in some way. Um, so we, used, we have that information for all of our schools. However, because of the changes, the comparability isn't there. Um, the change that's taken place, and this is in the paper um, at the top of page four. So in 2014, the foundation phases of learning um, were revised to align them more with the national literacy and numeracy framework, as well as making them more demanding. So they started that in September 2015. So this current cohort of children who have just completed the foundation phase in 2018 were the first group of children who have been subject to those refined areas of learning and to the more demanding assessment. That's the change. And that's why the table, the, the graph um, at the top of page four there has got the, the dashed line and the two dots, which we saw last year with the change in the calculation around uh, GCSEs. Okay. I wonder, as you weren't here at the start, when we all introduced ourselves, if you'd like to introduce yourself before you make your comments. Sorry, could could you press the, the button? That's it. You you you'll get the the full glow of the cameras on you now. <laughs> um, apologies for arriving late. I'm Mrs. Wakeley. I'm the um, representative from the Monmouthshire Association of School Governors. Um, and actually, Mr. McLean has answered my question. It was about comparing what, what, what the national test data look like compared with, with that. But obviously, we can't use that as a barometer anymore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and and welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Mr. Fowler. Um, we're, we're seeing a great picture upward trend generally. Um, and, and thank you for putting the kind of numbers in on that 
um, first page so we can work out our percentages. So I'm then looking down at the bottom level, at the very start of education, so at um, the foundation phase results, and seeing English uh, outcome five got 91.4% uh, and similarly maths got seven, uh, 91 uh, when you get the calculator out, that, that then equates to 78 kids across Monmouthshire that didn't achieve the expected level. I'm presuming a chunk of those will be ALN, but I'm presuming they're not all ALN. So I'm just wondering what we're doing to support those at the bottom that are not quite achieving to make sure that they do make the progress and, and have a successful future ahead of them. That's the key part is about progress and that's, you know, what we will come to see. And, you know, as I said, I, met, I mentioned earlier the FFT piece uh, and that very clearly differentiates between attainment and achievement. And I think for, for, for you as a, as a select committee, I think that's something which you should really hold very close in terms of a, a real challenge to, to me and to, to our schools because, you know, attainment is something which is likely to be born out of the nature of our county, largely, um, because exactly as the members have commented on this morning, many children come from very supportive households where they are able to be supported through their education and so on. So their attainment, um, getting the ultimate, the, the outcome at the end, is one thing. The progress that all of our children make from whatever their starting position on is around achievement and that's something slightly different so actually being aware that when we're thinking about outcomes we're thinking in terms of both attainment which is rightly celebrated but also around achievement which I suspect at other times isn't so you know when we think about key stage four if a child achieves um, an A um, but was always going to achieve an A then that's a great thing that they got their A if a child goes from being you know traveling along with an E and gets to a D, then they've actually made a grade of progress, which in some regards actually might be a better outcome than actually the child achieving the A that they'd always had. So there's some things where we need to think about that. Um, I, all of our schools, um, and I'm sure Mr Fowler you'll know from the school where you're a chair, you know, work across the whole class. Um, one of the things we had yesterday was Tracy um, Peed, who's the, um, the lead for the ALN transformation, but still talking fundamentally around the importance around differentiation, the importance of that as, um, as excellent teaching practice, the importance of teachers being able to teach similar subjects, but to the range of abilities that are in those classrooms. So um, I'm confident that um, our schools continue to work with that. And actually one of the really positive things is when I go out to speak to our head teachers, when I go to visit schools, you know, quite often the stories they say, they tell me that they are most proud of are the progress of those children who might not make the expected levels. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think you can be assured that the schools are always doing their very best. Thank you very much. Um, okay, a, a couple of things from me before before we wrap up, if if I may, Mr. McLean. Um, you mentioned that we don't have any results yet, any outcomes from free school meals and looked after children, uh, which is an area where traditionally Monmouthshire does far less well. Uh, and I hope that uh, as that detail becomes uh, available, you'll bring that back to us. Uh, and also, you, categorization has been mentioned. Uh, and uh, my understanding of categorization is that it primarily determines the level of support that a school should get. Um, we have only a couple of certainly primary schools in the red category in Monmouthshire, uh, and, and as a result, they get more support than other schools. I wonder, is there any evidence, or could you get any evidence, as to the increase in progress in those red schools that might be as a result of the additional support they get, because one would expect if the support was effective, that they would start to make increase in progress so they could get out of that red categorization. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, on your first point, uh, absolutely, the vulnerable groups report will definitely come back to you. Um, it will probably be um, in the new calendar year, 
um, in terms of when that data is available, and we've been able to, to analyze that. With regards to categorization, um, categorization traditionally had three parts to it. Um, the first was a data-driven, entirely blind exercise that took um, values over a three-year rolling um, baseline. Um, the second was a judgment on a school's capacity to improve. And the third was a, a combination of those two judgments. So you would score, um, I think, numerical for the first stage, one to four, um, alphabetical for the second stage, and then a colour would be generated at the end of that. I think that's the right way. Um, and you're absolutely right that red is the, the category that, uh, that warrants the most significant support um, in our instance from the um, Education Achievement Service, our partners, the EAS. Um, Categorisation has changed. Um, again, um, the removal of the data-driven element means that we're now more sufficient, more focused um, around standards around teaching and learning, um, around leadership, um, and around a school's capacity to improve. So that's more about um, how categorization is undertaken. So what we would hope to see is that following significant intervention in any school, that there is um, progress. So if a school was red following significant intervention, you would hope to see that school turn amber and in due course yellow, and potentially even after that into green. Um, you may not, because of the nature of categorization, see differentiation in terms of pupil level outcomes, because the categorization and support might not necessarily have been due to the pupil's outcomes, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you could have a school that, given where it was, um, was achieving very, very, very high outcomes, but was dysfunctional in the way the school was led, and there were very poor standards of teaching and learning. Now, I don't think that's the case in Monmouthshire, um, but actually, the following year, you could have seen considerable improvement in leadership and the school would have progressed, but the school would have continued to reach those very high standards of pupil outcomes. So the two are slightly, um, they are related clearly in the vast majority of cases, and I've just given an extreme example. But actually, you would expect to see schools progress. So this year, when we receive our categorization report from the AS, and it's a report we always bring back to, um, to CYP Select, it will be interesting to see the mix of schools and the various um, the proportions that we have in the various elements and the various colours. Um, I think last year when I did my chief officer's report I talked around shades of green um, and I think that's something that we've got to be conscious of and I think it's something that we need to be aware of that um, um, there may be some variability in terms of and some movement um, but we don't have a a full picture at all. In fact, I'm only aware of a couple of schools' outcomes at the moment, and uh, before they go through the regional and a national moderation progress process for categorisation, I wouldn't like to offer a view about where we'll be this year. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, if we could just wrap up then, um, this uh, report, there are no recommendations, it's just for us to note at this point, but in terms of looking forward, I wonder if we, if we could add to the work programme that we would like a further report, um, and also to mention uh, again next week's seminar on outcomes at key stage four and five. But in bringing a further report, you mentioned uh, Fisher Family Trust data and the ability to, to show progress from starting points, which I think in our context is so important. Um, and, and particularly uh, holding schools to account and being able to show that from wherever they started, all the children are making progress, which I think is a key judgment, isn't it? So if we could add that to um, uh, things moving forward, and if I could thank you very much for bringing that report to us this morning, Mr. McLean. Um, so moving on then, agenda item seven is to confirm the minutes of our previous meeting. Um, members have had these for a week now, and certainly the detail in which you've scrutinized the other reports, I have every confidence it's the same with the minutes. So um, are there any uh, inaccuracies or uh, issues that you would like to raise about those minutes? I certainly don't intend at this point to go through them page by page. Okay, would somebody like to move that we accept them? Okay, somebody second? Yeah, there we are. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, item number eight is the uh, Select Committee Forward Work Programme. 
Uh, Miss Eilert, would you like to talk us through that very briefly? And perhaps you'd also like to, to, to cover at the same time item nine, the uh, Council and Cabinet Forward Work Programme. Okay. Um, your next meeting, Chair, is on the 29th of November. Um, we've got some deferred items um, which you'll be aware of. The support for refugee children. Um, we'd invited King Henry Comprehensive, Derry View Primary and Gwent Ethnic Minority Service to the meeting and unfortunately they were unable to attend today. So that's been deferred to the 29th of November with a, an invite to Strong Communities members because they, they were also interested in, in this sort of area. We've also got a planned item, uh, which is the play action plan and play sufficiency assessment that's been booked in for some time. And we've also got some potential other reports, a partnership agreement report. And now um, Mr. McLean has, has mentioned that we've got um, a, a school uh, report on Key Stage 4. And will, will there be scope to build in the Fishers Family Trust data within that? We'll do that. Is, well, because no. FFT won't have the data from that full data set by the time okay. we do that report. So that'll be a first cut report. That's that's okay, it. okay. So it, it's looking like quite a lengthy meeting, Chair. Four, four items on there. Um, and then moving on through, um, we've got... That would be your last meeting before Christmas unless you chose to call a special meeting. You've then got uh, your... 24th of January regular meeting which is reserved for budget scrutiny so we can't add anything to that but I've, I've got some items coming out of today's meeting which is you'd like to scrutinize um, the safeguarding arrangements in terms of home to school transport you'd also like a discussion on family support services particularly the recently implemented edge of care team and base so um, if, if we were to take those and also a request from an officer to look at future options for Mountain House, it would require you perhaps call in a special meeting in January at some point, either before the budget scrutiny on the 24th or perhaps just after, depending on how time skills fit with, with decision making. So is that OK? Yep, we can have a discussion near the time about the need for a special committee. Councillor Brown, you had a point. Uh, yes, I think it was really to do with um, uh, the minutes in relation to the uh, previous meeting. Um, it's on page uh, 74, and it says, uh, a member mentioned that there were some suggestions for topics in the last minutes. It was also suggested that pioneer schools could be invited to a future meeting to give their impression of curriculum reform and development the chair will follow this matter up with the scrutiny manager and it's just a question of um you know that was raised as a uh, as a potential um forward um uh work program report and i think um uh, the chief officer of education seemed seemed quite happy about that when it was mentioned um before um and the other question that I'd got as again I don't know whether this comes under actions arising or or whatever but on page um, 71 of the minutes um, it was basically there was a report from the EAS and it said it was not known if there will be a formal consultation to allow parents and others to comment on the draft curriculum in April 2019 more information will be sought and it's a question in terms of a follow-up action um you know has that more information um been sought because i think it would be useful to know because there is such a radical change in the curriculum that um it would be useful if if that that was open to um public consultation um in terms of the changes thank you um, on the second point first, I, I attended the AGM of the EAS on your behalf recently and uh, there was no discussion there of being in a position to start that public consultation yet. Things are still, I think, very much in the air, but it's something we will keep an eye on and, and participate in that consultation as and when it, it's there. Um, the second point, uh, yes, um, the scrutiny manager assures me that that point is in the forward work programme, so it will come back to committee. 
um, could I just ask ask again, Chair? So does does that mean that um, the expectation is is that there will be a public consultation and this committee will um, push for one in relation to the um, you know changes in the curriculum? Thank you, Mr. McLean. Have you got any comment? I, only I mean I think things are still very much um, being worked through. I think we are expecting to see a draft of the new curriculum um, in the spring term. Um, the whole process has been led through schools so led through pioneer schools with expertise from universities and so on um, being kind of drawn into that into those areas of learning um, i am not sure that there will be a full public consultation on what that curriculum looks like um, i'm not sure that there has been a full public consultation on curriculum redesign in the past um, uh, to be honest, I, I don't think it would be something which you would necessarily consult the public on. So I'm not sure I would be minded for the committee to try and make that representation. OK, thank you. That's a, that's a very uh, fair point. Well made. Um, that being the end of this morning's business, if I could um, thank our two new members of the committee. I hope uh, it's not put you off and you'll be here again for our next one. Uh, thank you to the chair of the audit committee for sitting patiently through the whole morning um, and thank you all for coming and, and uh, thank you to our senior officers for their invaluable contribution. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.